Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm you, as you all know me, uh, my name is Ana Paula Vélez. Uh, I'm one of the uh, infectious disease attending for the University of South Florida. And today I'll be talking about um, neutropenic fever and some clinical syndromes. But I consider that you need to be aware when you are exposed to this um, type of patients. So I wanted to um, illustrate a few concepts that are important. Um, the total um, uh, neutrophil count um, and the way to calculate this. Here is a formula that you um, can use um, to illustrate, uh, to calculate the uh, total neutrophil count. Um, it is also important to know for how long the neutropenia lasts. It's not the same to have somebody that is neutropenic only for seven days versus a month or three months even. The risk of infections go up as the period of neutropenia extends. And there are different pathogens or organisms that you can see when this happens. Um, obviously, the chemotherapy that the patients receive is important because there are some chemotherapy uh, chemotherapeutic agents that can induce mucositis and remember that what happens in the mouth happens in the back, right? So you may have bacterial translocation from the mouth, the bowel, or even the rectum. So um, all these things are important to keep in mind. It is also important to know the history of the antivirus that the patient receive prior to chemotherapy because that increases the chances of having a bacteria that may be resistant to the previous antibiotics. So if the patient spike a fever while on certain uh, antibiotic regimen, then probably the bacteria that it will grow this time will be resistant. It is also important to know the bacteria, so the organisms that the patient had before. Um, when we see a patient at Moffitt, we like to go up to a year at least to see the organisms that the patient has culture in different areas, sputum, urine, and blood. Why? Because these bacteria in this population usually come back or may come back. Remember on these patients, their enemy is their own flora. Um, and also remember that um, the, uh, when they spa these patients become neutropenic, that increases the chances of infection, but also some chemotherapeutic agents may um, affect um, different uh, functions of the um, uh, immune, immune function. For example, um, it, it may affect the chemotactic properties, the phagocytic properties, etc. And also some malignancies have problems with their immune system. So that all adds. Um, remember also that um, some malignancies, for example, CLL, can have abnormal antibody production and also multiple myeloma. And some patients may have splenectomy. These patients are at risk for encapsulated organisms such as streptococcal pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, meningococco and camnocytophagia canimorphus. T cell defects are associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma and that results in increase of infections due to um, intracellular organisms such as Listeria, Salmonella, Cryptococco and, and Mycobacterium TB. Um, some patients that have um, <coughs> ALL <clears throat> uh, CNS tumor, tumors and other cancers, um, or patients who receive high doses of chemotherapy, remember, they may be at risk for uh, uh, pneumocystis gerovesi, PCP. So not only you, <clears throat> you have to have HIV to have PCP, but some malignancies and previous use of steroids can put you at risk for that. These patients may be lymphopenic with low CD4. So let's just start with the case. A 65-year-old female newly diagnosed with AML was admitted for induction chemotherapy. Two days after admission, she develops a fever up to 101.5. Her
Her ANC is 40. Her physical examination is remarkable for the following findings. Um, any volunteers? What, what, is, what is this, this slide um, in the upper part? What is that? How, mucositis. And what about this thing here? Gingivitis. So mucositis and gingivitis. So you, you do a physical examination and the only thing that you find is the mucositis and the gingivitis and also fever. Depending the cultures, what antibiotics will you start? Doxycycline, Cipro, Flagyl, Balacyclovir, Posaconazole, Vancomycin, Cefepin, Balacyclovir, Posaconazole, Vancomycin, Piptazole, Balacyclovir, Posa, or none of the above? Volunteers? Excellent. Why not B? No anaerobic. Very good. Um, do we always need to add vancomycin in that case? Technically, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, however, our main concern sometimes in these cases is strep viridans. And sometimes strep viridans may not be fully susceptible to penicillins. So if you are that concerned, if that's the case in your institution or where you're practicing, you may consider vancomycin. Also, if you see, uh, uh, if the patient has a catheter that uh, may be infected, so. Very good. Um, so, um, this uh, brings us to um, the, ne the next group of infections, bacterial infections. Just so you know that from 1995 to 2000, we have seen that the number of gram-positive infections are increasing compared to in the past. Um, and now gram-negative organisms account only for 22 to 14 percent of all the bloodstream infections in neutropenic patients. The common gram-positive includes Staph aureus, Staph epidermis, and Streptococcus. So that's why in neutropenic fever, um, normally the um, some of the guidelines don't include vancomycin for the first neutropenic fever, only under certain circumstances, but you have to keep in mind that the incidence of gram-positives are increasing because of the catheters. Uh, the ne um, normally, so the first week of neutropenia, you, the patients are at risk for bacterial infections. Second week, mainly yeast. After the second weeks, then you see molds. Now, these things are changing and there may be some patients that are on chronic steroids that present with mold after five days of neutropenia. So, but that's a general rule. So we see here on, uh, on your left side <coughs> uh, yeast and your, on your right side you see a mold, uh, Aspergillus, with the co conidias of Aspergillus illustrated there. The next group of infections is um, viral infections. Um, something that you uh, need to keep an eye on, HSV reactivation and VCV reactivations uh, may occur uh, in some group of neutropenic patients, especially the ones that go for induction chemotherapy that develop bad mucositis and the ones that have prolonged neutropenia. Um, this is a, a point that I wanted to bring about strep viridans. Increased incidence of strep viridans. Um, uh, risk, risk factors for that include high risk uh, uh, chemotherapy, such as induction chemotherapy, uh, patients with mucositis, and patients who have been uh, previously on quinolones. The strep, so technically, Levaquin should provide some coverage for strep viridans, but since these patients have been exposed so much to quinolones for prophylaxis of short uh, periods of neutropenia, then if they break through with the strep viridans, that strep viridans will be very likely resistant to quinolones. Up to uh, 20 to 60 percent of the of the strep viridans may be resistant to penicillin. Um, I'm sorry, non-susceptible to penicillin and high levels of resistance of penicillin can be seen in 20 percent. And there is even some tolerance to vancomycin, but we have not seen that at Moffitt yet. 
What is the definition of neutropenic fever? Single temperature of 38.3 or 101.3 or sustained temperature of 38 or 100.4. Remember that elderly patients or patients who are on steroids may not, may not have fever and still be bacteremic. Um, because as you age, the signs of infection may be subtle. So you need to pay attention to the blood pressure, the heart rate, and even the respiratory rate. It's good when you see the patients on daily basis and you know them, because then you can uh, detect subtle changes on that. There are some predisposing factors for this neutropenic fever, and that include profound and prolonged neutropenia, obviously, comorbidities, chronic catheters, and mucositis. So that sounds like most of our patients at Moffitt. Remember that, for example, here at the VA, you may see some neutropenic patients, but most of the time there are low risk, meaning that they recover the counts within a week or two. So it's not like you need to put them on uh, heavy mold prophylaxis or um, vancomycin or but when you have a, when we're talking about high risk neutropenia are the ones that are going to be neutropenics for more than two weeks, induction chemotherapy, etc. So that's different. Um, what is neutropenia? An absolute neutrophil count of less than 500 or less than a thousand with expected decline to less than 500 in 48 hours. And interestingly enough, a neutrophil count less than 100 for three weeks or, or more than that is associated with an infection in almost 100% of the cases. Now this is a, this um, graphic illustrates you how the neutrophil counts, a neutrophil count of two por, uh, 2,000 only give you, <coughs> you have a, a risk for infection only up to 2%, but as you go less than 100, the chances of infection go up to close to 30 percent. And this table basically illustrates more or less the same, but it tells you all infections in blue, severe infections in yellow, and bacteremias in, in, in red. Um, so you see here when the counts are from 0 to 99, how, you know, how high are your chances of having all infections in general and severe infections. Now, low-risk patients. Patients who go on outpatient chemotherapy um, that are stable, don't have comorbidities, who um, are going to have neutropenia less than seven days, have normal checks as ray, normal hepatic function, and there that when there is evidence of bone marrow recovery. Um, these patients, the use of prophylactic antibiotics is very controversial. Um, again, prior to uh, 1980, gram-negative uh, rods were the predominant organism, but now gram-positives are more pro prevalent. Why? Because we are using more uh, ports, lines, so the skin flora goes and infects the catheter. Uh, also because we're using more uh, aggressive chemotherapy, and also because uh, now we're using more quinolones to target the gram negatives that were very uh, common in the past. So the next group of bacteria that are going to break through are the gram positives. And this illustrates basically the same. Um, this is the year uh, at the bottom, and yellow gram positives and red gram negatives, and you see how the gram positive how it increased from 90, uh, 93 um, up until now, and gram negatives are decreasing. What I think is that in the near future, gram negatives are going to go up again, including the quinolone resistant E. coli and Klebsiella. Uh, they basically illustrates um, pretty much. Uh, this, uh, the same thing with uh, the group of bacteria, with some group of bacteria included also, uh, such as the anaerobic organisms. And um, again, uh, gram positives 
very common in uh, 2002 and up, up until now. Um, gram negatives are decreasing, polymicrobials are increasing, and anaerobes remain more or less stable. So let's go to a case two. 20 year old, um, I'm sorry, uh, female, um, yeah, 20 year old female who's been atropinic for six days. She's been prophylactically on le Levaquin. She develops gram positive cocci bacteremia and ground glass pneumonia and hypoxia. And this is the chest, the chest CT. This is the ground glass pneumonia that we have. Which is the most likely pathogen? MRSA, VRE, strep viridans, group A, strep, E. coli. Any guess? Um, very excellent. Why? Yes, very good. So, a strep viridans um, is an organism that often breaks through quinolones and um, the patients go on severe septic shock very quickly and they develop ARDS also from cytokine related um, um, disease. And that's from a study that was done in MD Anderson. They look at all the patients that had septic shock ARDS and the bacteria that were involved with this and they found that um, that um, strep viridans was um, highly prevalent um, and that the risk of strep viridans uh, increased with profound neutropenia and prophylaxis with uh, trimetropin and fluoquinolones. Now moving on to um, the most common causes of mucositis, chemotherapy, now, HSV also can reactivate when patients have uh, chemotherapy, mucositis, also candida species, and remember these patients are at risk for anaerobes, they are including fusobacterium, necrophagum, canocytophilia, oh, this one I cannot even pronounce, but how do you pronounce that? Ocrasia. So this type of um lives in some, um, some humans, in the mouth of humans some humans. Um, now, what about HSV and mucositis? These patients, when they have HSV, rarely develop uh, blisters because they don't have white blood cells, so there is no much inflammation. But you may see an ulcer with irregular borders with a white or red base um, and irregular border. So the reactivation rate with neutropenia and leukemia can be as high as 60%. So that's pretty high. And uh, following a stem cell transplant can be as high as 80%. So prophylax prophylactic prophylaxis with a cyclovir, valacyclovir, or fancyclovir may be indicated in, in the above cases. Resistant to a, cy to a cyclovir still remains rare. What's the mechanism? You guys remember? Thymidine kinase. And this is just uh, an example of oral HSBC. White base and irregular borders. And um, also remember that these patients, um, again, can have abnormal um, or different presentations of HSB. For example, in the genital area, you may see a recurrent linear uh, ulcers um, without necessarily blisters, or what they call the knife cut sign, intertriginous fissures. And this is a, just a, a point that I wanted to bring since we we're talking about the, the mouth and the mucoses. And that's lingua villosa or hairy tongue. Um, what you will see in this patient is a black or brown tongue and the problem is a uh, defective descamation of the filiform papilla. The normal length is about one millimeter but it can, it, in these patients can go, it may get up to 15 millimeters. 
and the causes include poor hygiene, chemotherapy, antibiotics, HIV, coffee, tea, tobacco, and the treatment is oral hygiene and uh, sometimes uh, topical antifungals may be indicated. This is just to illustrate to you a case of um, genital HSV and see how this patient doesn't have any blisters, but the borders are very irregular. And this is just to remind you that there are other gram-positive pathogens that can be seen in neutropenia. The famous gram-positives that are resistant to vancomycin that I'm sure you all know, leuconosto, pediococcus, and lactobacillus. And other emerging gram positives include Rhodococcus equi, Stomacoccus bacillus, and Clostridium septicum. This one particularly important for tifilitis, right? Now, what about VRE? So when we're talking about neutropenic fever, we have to include other bacteria that are emerging and that they are highly resistant. MD, and for example, in MD Anderson, up to 5 to 6% of the patients who um, who have a uh, hematologist malignancy or who are admitted for a transplant may be colonized with VRE. Up to tw 25 to 36 percent of these high-risk patients who go and have long neutropenia, they can get bacteremic. So in certain circumstances, fecal smear for VRE may be indicated. So if the patient develops fever, you know what the organism could be. Now, what to do with these high-risk patients that are going to have prolonged neutropenias that can be a risk to have VRE bacteremias? Um, well, actually, um, oh, sorry. Uh, these, um, these are some references here. Um, Oh, actually, yeah. I, some these references, these references here say that uh, um, up to three percent of ERE coloni uh, colonized patients with heme malignancies of um, uh, so the, the 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 chances of bacteremia went down from thirty percent to three percent on patients who are ERE colonized when daptomycin was used, and uh, some of our colleagues sent a poster about this to the. IDSA meeting um, last year. Now the problem is that eventually we're going to see adaptomycin resistant enterococcus. So things continue to be in evolution. Now what about catheter related infections? Of course the risk of infection is very high uh, with uh, patients with who are looking uh, have leukemia and have prolonged neutropenia. The chances of infections are higher within the first week of port uh, placement. Why? Because these patients have thrombocytopenia, they have hematomas, and the hematomas are good um, culture, you know, like just like an agar plate for these bacteria to grow. So when we see port hematomas in these patients, we take it very seriously. Um, so some centers are doing uh, doxycycline uh, oral to prevent that from happening as a part of the prophylactic therapy. Some other centers are doing catheters, catheters impregnated with minocycline to prevent line infections and more gram-positive cocci bacteremias. When we have a pre aggressive organism that infect the line, well, obviously we have to remove it. So we just want to prevent that. It's just, this is just a, an example of uh, poor cellulitis. When do we remove a port, especially in neutropenic patients? Um, remember that um, enterobacteria can often translocate from the GI tract to the blood without signifying that the port is infected because they have enteritis from the chemo, antibiotics, etc. But some other organisms may signify true port infection and the port 
uh, has to come out. For example, Staph aureus, Corinibacterium gencaisum, Bacillus species, Lactobacillus cosei, Pseudomonas, Polymicrobial bacteremias, and Candida species. Of course, recurrent bacteremias also, um, port abscess, uh, or septic phlebitis. Now, moving back to the case one, the patient resolved with Banco, Pipteso, Valacyclin, and Posaconazole. Uh, a week later, she developed a, a pain, painly, painless lesion shown here, and also cellulitis. What is that? So, cellulitis with an isolated skin lesion in a neutropenic patient, prolonged neutropenia. Which one? Uh, it could be in the differential, but there is one more. Ectima gangrenosum. Mm -hmm. So, which of the following choices would be the best choice? Change Pipteso to Clinda plus Cipro, change Posaconazole to Bori plus Mica and continue Pipteso, change Pipteso to Meropenem and Atobra, or none of the above? Yes, because that, with the choice C, we're targeting uh, Pseudomonas. Um, this is just to remind you that in the differential diagnosis of ectima gangrenoso, we have fusarium. Um, fusarium may cause uh, small lesions like the one that we see here um, in the uh, left uh, inferior part, and um, the lesions may progress and be as big as the one that we see in the left upper part. And this is just the banana-shaped conidias that we can see in the infusarium. So we already discussed this slide. Um, talking back again about uh, resistant bacteria that uh, may be seen in neutropenic patients, the bac uh, these, bac these gram-negatives include E. coli and Klebsiella resistant to quinolones, um, and also multidrug resistant pseudomonas, enterobacter, acinetobacter, and stenotrophomonas. So you always ask, so why are we giving prophylaxis if these, if these bacteria continue to become more and more resistant? Well, when, you, when you're giving these antivirus to these high-risk patients, you're buying time until the counts recover so they can get awfully cured from the leukemia. But then, you know, were created as the neutropenia goes more for months and months, and this we start seeing this bad box. I guess that's the price. Um, let's do another case. 35 year old female went to induction chemotherapy. Um, her, antimicrobial, her antimicrobials include vanco, cefepin, and mycafungin. The patient has severe right lower quadrant rebound tenderness, and there is a gram positive fraud growing in blood cultures. What organism will be that? VRE, Pseudomona, Clostridium septicum, C. diff, or Corinobacterium genkei? Great. The reason is that that's the agent of tifilitis. And DCT illustrates a bad colitis dilatation of the whole colon from initial tifilitis that is spread everywhere spread even to uh, the leg. You see the air um, next to the bone. And on physical examination, the air spread from deep inside to the abdomen and travel, uh, travel uh, down. And you see the bubbles, the blisters, I'm sorry, blisters. <laughs> this is the, um, the autopsy, and the colon is all necrotic. So, tifilitis, characterized by uh, right lower quadrant tenderness. The CT um, shows you tiken iliosicum, but it may show you pancolitis when the disease had spread. Uh, normally can be seen when the neutropenia is anywhere from 5 days to 21 days. The pathogens include Clostridium septicum, uh, some other gram negatives, rarely candida, and other molds. Uh, treatment is targeting the anaerobes. Uh, flagyl, sosimeropen, and oclindamycin can be used in these cases. So, 
continuing with the case, let's say that you cut this early and the patient didn't die and her abdominal pain resolved. She's now on neutropenia for 30 days. She develops fevers again. She has on a cyclovir, vancomycin, meropenin, and mycophungin. She develops a new fever, no other symptoms, and you obtain CT as a part of the workup. Remember, neutropenia fever, blood cultures, urine cultures, sputum if you can. Um, CT may be better to pick up some lesions that may not be obvious on x-ray on these patients, such as this one. And what is that? Uh, why is aspergillus? Good, but why? What's the sign? What's the sign? No, no, no. Re halo sign. Halo sign. That's a necrotic area in the middle surrounded by inflammation that uh, gives you the ground glass. Um, more, uh, it's be it has been best described in aspergillus, but other moles can cause it. Was it was the treatment of choice? Ampho plus fluconazole post IV and statin. Ask the nurse to call Dr. Green. That they always love that. Everybody always say D. <laughs> or BFM plus mica. And by the way, Dr. Green is uh, doing a mission in Bolivia, so he's not available. So. <laughs> <laughs> e, yes, yes, uh, and technically, if 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 boriconazole was listed alone, that's a good option too. It's just that there is more and more controversy about double antifungal therapy on these high risk patients. So the patient felt great for a month. Well, on a cyclovir, vanco, meropene, mica, and boriconazole. Today is Friday, 6 p.m. The news calls you again because neutropenic fever. She, the patient is now on neutropenic for four months. Believe it or not, we have we have cases, and she's waiting to be discharged on a complex IV therapy. <laughs> you order CT, and this is what you see. Now, what is that, Kevin? Reverse, Reverse halo sign. Uh, a dense area that surrounds a ground glass and. That's pretty much pulmonary infarcts um, caused by the angioinvasive mold Zygomyces. Zygomyces species that includes Rhizospus, Cunigamella, and Mucor. What's the treatment? Add POSA to boriconazole, amphotericin, change mica to caspo, intraplural 5 flu plus nebulized ampho, or E, the antifungals are very toxic and it's uh, better to wait until you have the official radiology report and the tissue diagnosis. So the, the, the treatment of choice is AMFO, very good. Uh, posaconazole has activity, um, but the drug of choice is amphotericin. Posaconazole is approved for the ones that cannot tolerate amphotericin. There is even more controversy about double antifungal therapy, including posa and AMFO. Well, I guess the patients at this point are so sick and the prognosis is so bad that maybe you can give them a few more days. Because for the ones that answer E, by the time you you have the tissue diagnosis, the patient is dead and the autopsy revealed disseminated zygomyces. So, continuing with the case, the patient, let's say that we were very optimistic. The patient um, made it through. The ANC increased from 0 to 400 and the patient develops fever and a rash. What's the therapy? ANC 400 recovers, develops fear and arrives. That's immune reconstitution. So it's, 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 it's mostly seen on patients who recover the counts very quickly. And there are some other factors involved that I don't think we understand fully, and that's more related to the immune system. And these patients may present with fever, rash, or fever and ground glass pneumonia, or fever and renal failure. And um, obviously, the patient um, is not as, you know, the ANC is already recovering, so it's not as, you know, as a high risk for infections, but nevertheless, your job is to rule that, you know, that out, but um, highly suggestive. Non-infectious causes on fever in neutropenic patients may also happen, but we just have to make sure that we cover the infections because that neutropenic fever is an emergency for infection. The patients can crash quickly. Um, so iris um, can do, can cause fever, growth factors, antibiotic related, 
don't forget that. Look at the fear, at what time the fear happens, if coincidence with any antibiotic, or if it, it occurred after the growth factor was started. Also, uh, chemotherapy regimens such as CLA can cause uh, fever. Don't forget when you're doing a physical examination to look in places that are often neglected. I'm not saying that everybody that has fear, you go and, and do a rectal exam, but you at least can ask. And if the patient tells you, yes, I have some um, hemorrhoids, some problems there, then you need to look. Um, some patients, they won't tell you because they, you know, they're shy. So you have to ask any problems, you know, any hemorrhoids or problems bothering you or in the genitals. Look in the axilla because sometimes uh, Accelerated for uncles can cause fear of unknown origin. And um, and re remember that some patients don't always have fear and still be infected. So remember to ask for these areas. Look at the pores, the IV lines for phlebitis. And even after you have your all your job, look all the labs, look all the places, you ask all the questions. Uh, bloodstream infection only accounts for uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the of the causes of neutropenic fever. Next is GI, uh, enterocolitis or perirectal skin also can cause that. Respiratory tract can cause infections in, in neutropenic fever, of course. But sometimes, up to 40 percent of the cases, you find nothing. Nothing that I will explain the neutropenic fear. And what to do in these cases, I'll discuss it uh, soon. So when you check the history on this patient, remember what the, what the patient talked for chemotherapy, history of antibiotic prophylaxis, steroids or not, um, documented infections in the past, allergies. And remember, so 50% of these patients that have neutropenic fever, you, don't, you find nothing that will explain the infection. So what to do with them, or what to do with the antibiotics? Well, that depends of the resolution of the fever and the resolution of the neutropenia. So if the uh, total neutrophil count um, becomes greater than 500 and you find no source of infection, then it's okay to stop the antivirus. Some experts advocate to continue the antivirus for seven, to, uh, seven days to two weeks, but normally at Moffitt we stop them and they do okay. This is just a busy slide that um, um, basically tells you what to use for the prophylactic antibiotics, etc., etc. But you can always refer back to here and read it more carefully. So the conclusions are: the treatment and prevention of infection in neutropenic patients remains in evolution. Why? Because the bacteria remain in evolution. <laughs> so what we use now for prophylaxis may not be accurate in the near future. Um, resistant to spectrum, post-spectrum antivirus continue to evolve um, and empiric antibiotics uh, are still used and guidelines should be helpful but not constrictive and always use your clinical judgment try to find what's the source of infection and that's it any questions